Uh, the longer the short is, Jess, I was uh, a couple of million pounds north of where I needed to be. And I needed hundreds of thousands of pounds of cash flow to keep this business afloat. And I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to fail. Um, I was um, I was worried that my family would think I was a failure. I was worried what my shareholders would say in my core business. And uh, it was purely my decision to, to set up this company. Um, and it was a market I didn't know. I overspent. Uh, I didn't do my cash flow forecasting properly. I thought I could walk on water. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Scott Russell is a London-born serial entrepreneur, investor and business mentor. With a family background steeped in business, he's gone on to become a prolific founder, building and successfully exercising five businesses across diverse sectors, from telecoms and recruitment to electrical data and engineering and even the world of coffee. Scott's ventures have yielded a combined value of a staggering £50 million. He was also the Sunday Times' Tech Awards finalist for three consecutive years. In this episode, Scott is refreshingly open about the challenges he has faced throughout his career. He delves into the setbacks he encountered with an aviation recruitment business and how this experience was impacted by the aftermath of 9-11 and the lessons that it taught him about overextending and the importance of seeking guidance when you're entering into new industries. Today, Scott shares his insightful journey filled with triumphs and setbacks. He's got lots of practical advice to offer in regards to how to plan entering new markets, being strategic, managing cash flow, and the crucial skill of learning from failures. He's got so much wisdom to gain. Obviously, he's a very successful uh, entrepreneur, so you're really going to enjoy this episode. This is Beyond the Fail with Scott Russell. Scott, thanks so much for joining me today. Really looking forward to this conversation. So, Scott, take us back. Where did it all start for you in business? Oh, where did it all start? So, uh, I come from quite an entrepreneurial family. So, uh, my parents had their own businesses. My uncles and aunties had their own companies. So, um, I was uh, born in Ilford, in Essex, but grew up um, with my grandparents and my parents in East London. And uh, we come from a family that were market traders, uh, that were car traders anything to do where they could buy something for a pound and sell it for two so uh it was always embedded it was always part of my life being around people that work for themselves i don't think any of my close parents or family had jobs they all work for themselves and what were those sort of businesses or what was the most i suppose successful business out of you know your family businesses well, but being sort of East London family, uh, market trading was, was probably the, um, the, 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 the chosen field. Um, so um, my parents had various sort of stalls from jewellery to fashion. Uh, my uncles and aunties worked uh, in the markets. So I think from fruit and veg all the way through to fashion, uh, costume jewellery. So yeah, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't quite uh, only fools and horses or a scene from lock, stock and two smoking barrels. But it was uh, quite an entrepreneurial East London upbringing, uh, which uh, which stood being well actually. And my first business was a, a horse chestnut business. I was twelve years old, and I was selling horse chestnuts. So tell us about that. How did that? Uh, how did that go? Did you exit from that one as well? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, not quite actually. Um, I, do you know what? I was working with somebody, and they was paying me five pounds per day to sell these horse chestnuts, and I realised that hold on, you know, I was probably taking seventy, eighty pounds a day, uh, and I think I'm getting paid five quid for this. So I remember thinking, well, you know, it's only an oil drum and it's only uh, some charcoal in the bottom and a grill at the top. And I, I, I know what, you know, we, we were buying a bag of chestnuts for. So uh, I, I created my own little brazier and uh, I started selling chestnuts um, uh, on, on the market stall in East London. And uh, I was taking 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds a day. Uh, and I was 12 years old. Uh, and the problem was, was cooling it down at the end of the day. Because my dad had to pick me up and he had to go back with his van 
And because this braze was boiling hot, mm. I really struggled to, to cool it down in a time that, that allowed my dad to pick me up quickly. And of course, I didn't want to stop selling. So I was being picked up at four o'clock or five o'clock. And I wanted to trade right to the last minute. Of course. So that I didn't lose any trades. But, uh, but yeah, that was the, yeah, my first business 12 years off. What involvement did you have with your family's businesses and the, and the markets? Did they get you on a stall early? Yeah, they did. So my brother and I uh, were sort of brought up with, with entrepreneurial parents. So come the weekend, you know, we, we didn't play run for your football. Uh, we did actually play football, I tell a lie, but uh, it was most important for us to join our parents when we were younger. Um, so we we did sort of hang around our mum's dad. We, we worked at the stalls. So, you know, whatever money that we could make by working for people, that we we did that. So one day I could be uh, just clearing up sort of garments and then I'd be working on fruit and vegetable. Um, so yeah, various, um, you know, we used to follow our parents uh, around the market stalls. What did that teach you? Uh, it taught me to uh, understand the value of a parent. Uh, it taught me honesty. Um, uh, or, you know, if, if you were seen pocketing a pound or two pounds or putting a fiver in your back pocket, you would get a slap and that would be a hard slap. Uh, and there's no way you could go back to your mum and dad and say, you know, my boss has just whacked me because I've kept five pounds in my back pocket. They would have probably said, you deserve that. You know, you don't steal. So it taught me honesty. It taught me integrity. Uh, it taught me to work hard. Um, so all of those good traits we talk about now, I think were embedded at a very young age. And was it inevitable that you were going to follow the entrepreneurial path and have your own business? Yeah, I think so. I wasn't particularly academic at school. Um, and, um, you, you know, like most um, sort of young kids growing up in the 80s, um, you know, it, it was a particularly good time to be in a state school. Um, there was lots of teacher strikes and it was the late 80s and, you know, you could bump off school and no one would know that you bumped off for days. So it wasn't really a great learning environment. And, and the irony is I have four boys now, four, four sons, and they've all gone to private school. They've all gone to four weeks. And, you know, if you talk to my sons now, they they talk with a very hot, frappy accent. And I've still got that East London drawl. So, yeah, they will say to me, how comes you're English? So how comes your son is English and you're Australian? And I'm saying, I'm not. <laughs> it's just <laughs> a byproduct of an education. But was there any other, did you see any other options for your path? Did you explore any other options apart from starting your own business? Was there anything else on the table? No. No, not at all. Not at all. It was always, um, it was bred into us at a young age that if you want to be able to afford the things that you want to do, then you got to work yourself. So um, in, in saying that, I, I, I digress slightly because I, I did have to learn a trade. So when I left school, uh, I joined the youth training scheme, the YTS, and my parents wanted me to learn a trade. So I went to work in the jewellery business in Hatton Garden, and I spent two and a half years uh, learning about jewellery design, manufacturing, uh, and working as, a, as a, an apprentice. And I also got a scholarship to study at Sir John Cass College, where I studied gemology, jewellery design, and business. So although I didn't go to university, um, I did get quite a good grounding from the age of 16 to and again, what did you learn? What was, well, what did you learn in those, in that um, formative years in in kind of jewellery? Because obviously, you know, being a, a kind of late teenager, you know, your first job, apprenticeship, that must have been a, a steep learning curve, or or wasn't it? Because you'd already grown up around business and market stores and trading. Yeah, no, I I, I didn't, I, you know, I, I was I, I felt I was leagues ahead. Because I understood, a, I, I could read a balance sheet. I, I understood profit and loss accounts. You know, I, I, I knew net margins, gross margins. I understood about putting money by for marketing. And uh, even in my in my in my young years, you know, just because you you earn a pound doesn't mean you make a pound. You know, and, and that money needs to be reinvested and it needs to be looked after. And there's a term that I use: that every pound is a prisoner, and every pound is a prisoner. You don't want to spend that frivolously. Uh, when it comes to jewellery design, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, Sir John Cass College is one of the best colleges in the world for jewellery design at the time. And uh, to train with some of the, the greats in the industry was just brilliant to see to see that. And uh, and I got to work for some fantastic brands, the likes of Graf. I worked for Cartier. Uh, I did some work for Rodex. I, I studied horology. So, uh, yeah, it was a really good two and a half years. Uh, the problem being I was making no money. I was being paid £28 a week on the youth training scheme. So I'd commandeered the uh, 
the jewelry benches and uh, I was making money at the weekend mm. by uh, hiring out the benches to my colleagues and um, and at the time my parents were in the jewelry business so um, I was I was making more money in my lunch break than I was to the rest of the week. It might be a stupid question, but was that a, a kind of key driver that the you know the the money aspect and the rewards you were going to get from that was that a kind of key driver for you to then like start your own business? Um, no, not really. I, I think sort of starting my business was a prerequisite. I was going to do that anyway. Um, but I realised that I wanted to go into the jewellery business. So I wanted to my a jewellery business when I was um, left school when I was sixteen. Um, and I thought, well, this is the way that you've got to try and because people, um, when you're making jewellery for sort of, you know, a couple of thousand pounds, people expect you to be able to put a good design together. They'd expect you to understand how to grade a stone. You know, they would expect, you know, that this was something that I, that I learned at a pretty young age. So, um, and I wanted to do things properly. I wanted to do, um, I wanted to create a, a jewellery business that I was proud of. Um, the problem being, I was, I was robbed a couple of times um, and, and quite violently as well. So, um, it got to a stage where um, it was just untenable to run a jewellery business where I was living at the time. So uh, that forced me into a new a new area. So that was one of my first failures in life. It's, uh, it's okay, but you've got to make sure that uh, you can cover your back. So were you robbed when you were working or in the store? Twice. Twice. So um, I, I, we, I had a, a small van, a little Fiat, Fiorino van. And uh, I parked it once um, when I stopped to, to pick up some stock and the van was broken into and uh, my stock was taken. And it doesn't take a great deal, uh, uh, many bags to, to create the jewellery that was in the back. So it wasn't difficult to, to steal jewellery. And the second time um, they broke into my parents' house and uh, they ransacked the house looking for the jewellery. Um, and uh, they used a crossbow to try to shoot my dog. Um, and, and that was that was quite horrific at the time. Luckily, the dog survived. There was no problem there. But uh, but they did run off with the jewelry, and, uh, and that was quite a scary moment. And I think that was a pivotal moment when my parents said to me, "You know, you've got to move out, or you've got to relocate your business somewhere else." Yeah, that sounds um, uh, kind of horrific. So that was your own jewelry business that got robbed. Yeah, yeah. But when we say I had a jewel, I had a jewelry store. Yeah, and uh, and I would I would buy jewelry, I'd repair the jewelry. Yeah, I would, um, I would um, uh, polish it, and then. Um, so I'd buy at what we call scrap value and sell at retail value. Uh, and I used to operate on market stalls in East London. So, um, you know, it was quite dangerous. I mean, you know, it was it was a time of early 90s. Um, and, you know, I was a young guy on my own. Uh, you know, you could be turned over pretty quickly uh, and fast as well. And and jewelry is very easy to steal because mm. it's it's not bulky. You know, you mm. can get a couple of thousand pounds in your pocket and run. So, um, you know, that I was always on my guard. Um, and uh, although I was a little scrapper, a little fighter, you know, you're not going to fight, you know, three, four people. That want to take you to or someone with a crossbow. Yeah. I mean, it sounds pretty scary. So, I mean, obviously that isn't the failure that we're going to kind of talk about today, but I mean, it does sound like that was quite a big kind of setback. What were the ramifications of that theft or those thefts? Well, obviously, I, I you know, I lost, I lost my business because um, you, you can't insure against things like this. Uh, and certainly, I didn't have the correct uh, infrastructure to, to be able to give me short policy to cover me either. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was a, it was a sobering time. Um, I thought I could bounce back from the first robbery, but um, I did bounce back from the first robbery. But I, unfortunately, I couldn't bounce back. And uh, I decided a career change was required. Um, so then I uh, I got a job as a in London as a, what we call an OPC, which stands for a, an outside people catcher. So I had a clipboard, and my job was to work as a self-employed agent to 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 pull data to get you to stop and talk to me, and to give me your information so our sales team could then um, sell their products and services to you. And I did it as a stopgap, but I was really good at it, really good. But that robbery and those, you know, and the fact that that sort of closed your business, particularly at a sort of young age and one that you had been training for for quite a number of years. Was that something that had a big impact on you personally? Did that was that did that really feel like a big setback? And you know, like your dreams are in sort of tatters. I think um, I, I was angry. Um, I was combative. Um, I wanted to find out who stole my jewelry. Um, I I started to become, um, you know, uh, aggressive towards anybody. 
Um, I didn't think the police did a great deal, and um, it, it wasn't a good place to be. It was, um, you know, um, it, I had to pivot, so I went from um, providing, um, working on a market store to doing uh, bespoke jewellery, and uh, and that's when my house was robbed. So um, not only did they get me on the road for my market store, but they robbed my house where my, my workshop was. So I just realised that, you know, I'm, unless I was protected into a, um, a security um, sort of business, maybe in Hatton Garden, or, uh, you know, it's going to be difficult to, to keep this up. And once you've been robbed twice, then the child's side, you'll be robbed a third time as well. Do you think there's anything you could have done differently on those, in those occasions? Um, I think, um, yeah, I was probably quite young. I was probably quite outspoken. I was, um, um, you know, uh, probably slightly arrogant and, um, you know, I would undercut anybody that, that could, to, that could uh, offer the service that I was offering. Um, I got involved in a, in a fraternity that liked their jewellery, but, you know, you probably couldn't trust them. Um, and uh, I, I, I decided that, you know, that probably was one of the reasons why I, I had I grown the business slower and I've taken my time, had I chosen my clients better, then perhaps I wouldn't have exposed myself to uh, the wrong type of people that perhaps um, were the people that, uh, that robbed me. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like a, a difficult lesson at a young age. It was a lesson, but I but I learned an awful lot because you know I, I'm I'm a trained gemologist. Uh, as I said, I've I've, I've studied horology, and it's a trade that I can always go back to. Um, and I and I enjoy the jewelry trade. Uh, I enjoy the watch trade. So uh, I know that I've always got that as a, a backup if I ever wanted to go into an industry like that. So uh, so yeah, I don't think it was wasted time. Uh, I think I learned lessons in life that, uh, that stood me well. No, of course, of course, and that's what you know those kind of. Um challenges and, and and setbacks are about and obviously that's what you know the the theme of this uh of this podcast is and it sounds like your your parents are always you know very supportive of you and obviously allowing you to mm. you know store all that jewelry um in, in their house for example have they always been supportive and encouraging of you know your business ventures and was there ever any just out of interest i suppose going back to what we were talking about before was there any sort of, you know, expectation or pressure from them that you were going to follow them down the entrepreneurial path? No, not at all. There was no pressure. Uh, and, and my parents have always been very supportive. And even now, actually, you know, I'll, I'll call my mum three or four times a week. And uh, she's an old walks. You know, she's um, she's a sprightly 76-year-old, um, still working as a commercial artist now. Um, so still running a little business. And, um, you know, no, absolutely not. My parents were, were, were really supportive. I think my my mum and dad were that um, they got pretty pissed off when their house was broken into, uh, and the people that broke in had one thing on their mind, and that is to rob their son. So, um, what my parents said is that go and get yourself a job and go and get yourself a house. So I did. I did come out and get myself my first house, uh, and I did go and um, manage to save up. Uh, I've never had a problem earning money, Jez. That's one thing I've never had a problem with. So, um, uh, and in the early days that you could get a mortgage quite, quite easily and um, I managed to buy my first house um, and and that was probably a turning point for me. Had I had it quite comfortably at home, then maybe I wouldn't have done uh, my business so quickly. So, I suppose fast forwarding, what was your first serious business um, or business that, you know, you got some traction well, so I've I've built, uh, I've founded five companies and I've exited five companies um, uh, for a little over fifty million pounds. So um, I, I'm, you know, by no means, um, you know, it's pocket change compared to you know, Facebook and the entrepreneurial uh, tech engineers now. But um, you know, I've, I've managed to, to earn some pretty good money over my thirty three years in business. But in answer to that question, um, I, I got into telecoms very early. And it was at the time when uh, BT were, were duopolized. So they had, they brought in a, a second carrier called Mercury Communications. And um, there was a whole industry of selling uh, cheaper calls and BT were providing calls for. Um, and I got into telecoms by, by an outside people catcher and I set up my own company. And then I, I founded that business. And I got a lucky break uh, working for a, um, a plumbing company and they wanted to create a call center. And... Uh, so um, these were before call centers were even heard of. It was, it was a, quite a, an unusual concept. 
and I managed to design a call center and I managed to work with them. Uh, but rather than doing it through um, through, through a company, I, I, I did it as a joint venture. So to kind of very long story short, um, we, we created one of the world's, what were the UK's first call centers that allowed inbound payments to be made over the telephone using your telephone keypad. Um, and I built that business and I sold it to GE Capital. Uh, and at the time, GE Capital were the probably the largest company in the world by market capitalization. And that business went on to become a national plumbing brand. Um, but I founded that and exited that business with 5.7 million quid. Um, I mean, that's a massive achievement at, at that age. How did that feel? Good. Uh, it would have felt a lot better had I taken tax advice. Um, but, um, and, you know, I must admit at the time then I did have five partners in the business. So it wasn't just me that founded it. So it does sound um, very glorious. But, um, you know, I still walked away with a healthy check. Um, and, um, you know, the first thing I did was buy a bigger house uh, because that's what you do. Um, you know, I paid off my mortgage and uh, I bought a Porsche car and um, bought a Rolex watch and uh, all the little things, the trinkets that, that you do when you're 20, 24 years old. Um, and then uh, because I didn't take the correct tax advice, I had to reinvest a big chunk of that money into another company. And that was probably the, 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 the biggest point of my life because it then forced me to roll that gain into another business. And that company went on to become a very large company that was eventually sold to the Australian government owned Telco, Telstra. And uh, if you look at Companies House, uh, I think I'm still uh, the uh, the shortest ever director of Telstra Europe. Uh, I was a director of that business for a 23. Wow. Not 24, just 23. Um... <laughs> 23. And I think I had to, before I sold the company, I had to join the board of directors right. while I okay. transferred the business over. I then had to resign the following day. But uh, at Companies House, it still has me up there for uh, that uh, not even one day. I think that makes me the shortest term ever for a global PLC. But, uh, I'm sure there's people that have been fired quicker than me, but this was all constructed. Would you have gone on to start another business or reinvest that money if you hadn't had a tax issue? I, I would have probably taken more time. I would have probably enjoyed the money a bit better. Um, I, w I would have probably um, travelled a bit. I would have enjoyed my car. Um, so, um, yeah, I didn't. Um, I, I, I probably stopped working for about three months. Um, and then I was back into another business again. Um, and that allows you to use what they call a rollover relief. So as long as the investment is put back into a trading company. You can roll the gain over. I just keep on rolling the gain over indefinitely. So um, yeah, but I but I enjoyed it. Um, I was um, excited, and when you start up a business for the second time, and you've got a good working capital there, then it takes away the stress not having um, sufficient working capital to be able to do the things that you know you're the right things to do. Have you ever um, had that in a business when you've you've had cash flow problems? Um, you, well, I think all businesses have cash flow problems um, or, or cash flow issues or, or cash flow uh, constraints. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's um, you know a profit and loss is is almost like a, a disease. But having no cash is a terminal disease. It's it's a heart attack. So if a business runs out of cash, there's not a lot you can do. Um, you can hide losses in the business. You can push those losses forward. But not having enough cash in a business is is enough to to, to kill that business. Uh, fortunately, uh, I've never been in that position where I've not had enough cash, um, apart from one company where oh, I did run out of cash very, very quickly, very scarily. And uh, and that was a global issue. Yeah, which we're going to come on to in a minute. I think, but just to, I suppose, touch on that, what, why do you think, apart from, you know, this one company that we're going to go and talk about in a minute, because as you said, the cash flow is, you know, such a big um, issue in, in companies, but particularly new companies, particularly small, you know, smaller companies. Um, and obviously that is statistically one of the biggest reasons why a lot of companies fail and, and, and you know, have to sort of shut their doors. So what do you think that mm. you've done differently in your companies not to suffer from those cash flow constraints? It, it, it's just, just, it, it seems... You know, obvious, but 
you know, the contracts that you agree will make sure they're geared in your favour. So, you know, um, it's really important that if you're trading with somebody that your exposure is limited. And I'll come on to that because the only time I didn't limit my exposure, it really sort of bit me on the arse. Um, but, you know, you, you learn from that. And, and really, when you start trading with supermarkets, and I've worked with Waitrose, Tesco's, um, you know, you, you, you know that they will have a rolling 90-day credit you know they'll expect you to put in offers um, and you know that you're going to have to cash flow that. So telling telling them a buyer that you don't have sufficient cash to deliver your fourth consignment because you haven't been paid for the last three that you've been delivered, it's not going to cut any ice. So, you know, you you know what you, you, you're in for. Um, you, your, your contracts are watertight and, you know, you've got to just make sure that you know what your exposure is. Um, and that's just common knowledge that I learned from the age of 16. So are you saying that most, well, in certain industries, lack of cash flow or poor cash flow is because of lack of planning? I think put, put poor management. Uh, I think the entrepreneurs have a, a tendency to say, yes, we'll do it. Let's do it. Let's, let's do it. Uh, you know, let's do it first. Worry about it later. You know, don't worry about it. Let's get the sales in. Let's get the sales in. And perhaps what they're not looking at is the cost element or the, the cost of bringing those sales in. They're maybe not looking at the overall margin those sales are bringing in. Um, and entrepreneurs tend to look at things with the glass half full. You know, rarely do you get entrepreneurs looking at glass when it's half empty. So, um, And I think that there is a pressure to keep on selling and keep on selling. And this over-trading is more, uh, more dangerous than under-trading. When you under-trade, you can dampen things down. You can, you can lay people off. You can look at your your supply chain and you can modulate accordingly. When you over trade, there's not a lot you can do. Everything happens so fast that you just don't have the momentum. You can't stop the momentum, um, and so that's why more companies tend to go bust from over trading than under trading. However, um, a company will go bust very quickly if it doesn't manage its cash flow. And what's the I suppose the things the or the guardrails that people can put in place? to avoid overtrading? Um, you know, you have a plan and stick to it. You know, if your target is to turn over 100 grand a month, um, then, and you have another order coming in, then let that roll into the following month. The customer's not going to go away. They're not going to say, okay, because you can't deliver it in June, we're not going to wait till July. They will wait for July if they want to buy your products. But what you're worried about, you lay in bed at night, your blood sugar drops, you think about the worst things and you know, you, you, you think of all these things that how the client's going to change their mind. They will not change their mind. What people seem to forget is selling is a coalition of the willing. It's about two parties that want to transact. Somebody wants to buy and somebody wants to sell. But your mind is telling you the deal's going to fall out of bed. Your mind is telling you someone's going to come in and undercut you. If you do your job properly, if your product is fit for purpose, then the chances are it won't be undermined. It, it, it will go through. And I think that that's a problem that most entrepreneurs do is that they grasp at every opportunity and not realise the ramifications of cash flow. Mm. Yeah, because I think it's, as you said, particularly when you're starting a business, it's there's a tendency to just chase the sales and chase the income as hard as possible because that feels like the best thing to do. And I suppose, and, you know, as you kind of mentioned that, income is it's perceived as the most important thing and then it will solve all problems yeah you know the, how many times have I heard just keep selling just keep selling just keep selling and and that's the worst thing you can do sometimes you're best not sell stop stop take stock of what's going on look at your uh, your management structure look at your supply chain um, you know and, and then you can start to, to kick the tires of your business mm. and then you can start to see the gaps that you don't see because you're running on a treadmill, you're running so fast, you don't actually see what's going on in your business. Um, and then your 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 products start to drop, your services start to drop, and then your reputation starts to drop and then it's a really slippery slide to get back up again. Because that's the thing, isn't it? I, I think you know it's such a common thing for new businesses where they're selling and then the sales probably exceed where they're able to deliver or the capacity that they're able to deliver. And that's the, and that's, as you said, it's a bit of a slippery slope because firstly, it's going to cause some 
potential cash flow problems if if they haven't got the the capacity to deliver but then also it's going to affect their customer experience as well i recently bought um, a leather settee a two-seater settee for my media room and uh, i bought it online and it was you know 1200 quid or something and uh, I, I loved it. The story was brilliant. It was Napa leather. It was made in Italy. And the, the video was fantastic. And I ordered it and I paid a, a 50% deposit. And um, and then, uh, you know, I was told it's going to be a, a three-week delivery time. Then it turned into a, an eight-week delivery time. Then it turned into a 12-week delivery time. Uh, and it's still not delivered to my, my wow. wonderful city. And what I've learned is that it's a dropship company. So they're selling the dream. They're selling the product. And uh, no doubt they're unethical. They're a great company i'm sure they are but the problem being the expectations are set up here and you know i'm now talking about this in a negative connotation and i don't know when i'm going to get my bloody settee but the fact is that if they would have told me mm. it was going to take 14 weeks i probably was still would have bought it mm. i probably still would have bought it but don't tell me it's going to take three weeks um and i'm quite an understanding guy and i don't really mind really it's, it's an extra settee on the side i'm, I'm not that bothered but the fact of the matter is, I'm talking about it to you now, and I'll talk to it about my friends. And when my friends come around for a glass of wine, I will not talk fluidly about this product. And that's a shame. So that's a company that are over-trading, over-promising, under-delivering, and they don't need to. No. Entrepreneurs believe that they've got to be the best product, the best price, next day delivery. And it's untenable unless they can deliver that. Mm. Which is... In some ways, the benefits or the advantages that Amazon's brought to the world, but also um, maybe the, the, a benchmark that not all businesses can deliver on, right? The expectations are so, and benchmarks are so high because of of Amazon's ability to deliver, it, you know, within potentially sometimes hours. Amazon, are, they're, a, they're a logistics big a business. You know, they're the world's largest logistics business. What does that mean? They move goods from A to B. That's what they do. And they use supplies like meat to provide those goods that they're moving. And their service is brilliant. And that's why it really uses Amazon. That's why it's one of the biggest companies in the world. They, they, um, they underpromise and they overperform in mm-hmm. many cases. And as you quite rightly said, I've sat at a dinner party where someone's orders up, putting wine on Amazon Fresh in London, and it's been delivered by the time we've finished that, that meal. That was a bottle of dessert wine, put in wine, <laughs> it was delivered before the end of the meal. And that's Back impressive. For mine. Yeah, 100%. Mm. So this um, this business that did have cash flow problems, tell us about that. So um, I was, at the time I was running a, a tech business, it was um, it was a digital, well, actually it was a, it was an electrical data and engineering business. Effectively, we were, we were putting big uh, infrastructure paving systems where um, the original Wi-Fi systems used to sit. Uh, and we were working with hospitals, with the NHS, big, big companies. We had a, a, a huge workforce and um, you know we were uh, delivering hundreds of millions of calls per day across our network. And uh, we were churning off loads of cash and, and it was making good money. And um, I decided that I would diversify. You know, I was, just, I was inspired by the likes of Richard Branson and all these people here that have multiple businesses all under one brand. And um, and I I thought you know I was talking to somebody actually at a football match I was watching my Sam play, and I asked him what he did for a living and he said uh, I mean recruitment so that's what I do, um, and I, I I couldn't get my head around how much money they were making in recruitment, um, and particularly uh, what we call contracted staff where they would put contracted staff into big companies, uh, they would cash flow that and then they would get paid by the company on thirty sixty or ninety days, so I thought right I'm going to do this this is what I'm going to do I'm going to set up a I'm going to sell for a very company, and uh, and I'm going to concentrate on an area that I think has got the biggest growth. And at the time, it was the airlines. So I managed to set this business up, and I I paid a fortune for the right type of people. Um, I paid over the top for a sales director. I headhunted a sales team. I put an amazing office together in London. Uh, it was no expenses spared, and and it was just it was all being cash flowed. Um, it was all being cash flowed through my other company. Um, and what happened is that uh, um, I was was putting staff into the airlines working at like British Airways, Virgin Atlantic, uh, and then there was a global disaster that happened, and that was 9-11. And the last thing uh, that happened is that uh, we probably had 1,500, 1,600 staff out of there. 
that we were cash flowing, that we were that we were that we were paying and hoping to collect the money from the airlines and the airlines all start fading for a period of time. We're taking on no more staff um, and we're kicking back on the staff that we put in there that we'd already paid for. Uh, the long of the short is, Jess, I was uh, a couple of million pounds north of where I needed to be and I needed hundreds of thousands of pounds of cash flow to keep this business afloat and I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to fail. Um, I was... Um, I was worried that my family would think I was a failure. I was worried what my shareholders would say in my core business. And uh, it was purely my decision to, to set up this company. Um, and it was a market I didn't know. I overspent. Uh, I didn't do my cash flow forecasting properly. I thought I could walk on water. And um, I ended up having to remortgage my house. And uh, I pretty much sell most of my stock in my core business to get myself out of trouble. I did a voluntary liquidation and I did pay back all my debts and I did pay people uh, that were paid to work. Um, but I was really scarred from the whole experience. No, of course. And I mean, th there's obviously a lot to kind of unpack there. I mean, it's obviously particularly, I would say, unlucky that you set up an airline recruitment business just before probably the biggest disaster to hit the airline industry ever um yeah. and it would be i suppose it's an interesting question to ask do you think that that business would have survived if 9-11 hadn't happened i i think um the, the way that we geared the business was uh the, the offices were very lavish we thought we had to be in prime location in london um i paid an absolute fortune to bring on board the best salespeople that i knew operated in the industry and um, it was the first time that I really started to invest the profits that I made in one of my other businesses into another company. And um, I, because I had ready cash, I had cash available to me. Uh, I talked about a pound being a prisoner. I certainly didn't put those pounds in prison. I certainly was very lavish. Uh, and I, I genuinely thought I could walk on water. Um, and I thought I could grow this and then exit this business and make millions um, and sell a business with reoccurring revenues with blue chip companies that I was working with. And uh, so uh, you're, in a very simple way, could it have been a successful business? I think it would have been. I do think it would have been, but I was sailing very, very close to the wind. And had there not have been 9-11, I think volatility in the world could have derailed that business anyway. Um, you know, th there's a reason why there is certain amounts of profit each industry makes. And I thought I could buck that trend to make huge amounts of margin on the service I was providing. But the service I was providing was no different than the other leading player in the marketplace. I just thought I could do it better and I could do it with more lavish. Um, and I, and I, I wanted everybody to think of my company when they were looking for a uh, temporary staff. And I'm a pilot, I'm a, I'm a private pilot, and I thought I could fly my plane through this turbulence uh, and I, I couldn't I, I had to laugh and you said that's a metaphor that's a metaphor yeah no absolutely <laughs> I, I, yeah I wasn't ex expecting you to, to fly your own planes as well as recruit a staff to be on the planes um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you said uh, the phrase you felt that you could walk on water where did that I suppose, belief come from? And then do you think that was your ultimate downfall there? Yeah, so um, my, my electrical data engineering is also really, really well. And we were growing through acquisitions. So I, I just built a, built, bought a business called Enstream Technologies and we integrated their client base into the company. Um, we borrowed money to, to, to buy the business and we offset that debt against the profit the business was making. And then we leveraged more more profit because economies of scale allow me to deliver the services with a, a much bigger company. And then I've gone from one office to four offices to an infrastructure. So it it, it just become uh, and everything was working brilliantly. You know we were we were making huge profits and so we had a, a telephony reseller business as a third company, a tertiary business that was just growing exponentially every month. It was a small business, but it then went on to become a fantastic business. Uh, and that sort of saved me. But, you know, I had these two really good businesses and I just thought, you know, I want three. I want to create a, I want to create a virgin. I want to be the next Richard Branson. Um, you know, when I'm young enough to do it, I've got enough cash to do it. And I think that's where, that was my, my failure. That was my, 
my um, my I didn't listen to my own story. I didn't listen to my own uh, my own advice, and I thought I could do it uh, and buck that trend. And when I say walk on water, I honestly thought nothing could derail. I honestly thought I could take on the world. And what do you think you missed there in terms of your thinking? Because it sounds like you were, um, I suppose, maybe not thinking about all of the the different risks. And obviously you mentioned that you were kind of maybe uh, spending more than you should have. Was that the only thing that you had kind of missed in your, you know, horizon scanning about potential potential risks and, and what could actually go wrong? Yeah, look, I think that, you know, the, the, the airline industry is a global industry and uh, currency fluctuations, I didn't really look into. Um, I didn't really look at the impact of, you know, paying people in dollars, but buying it in sterling, you know, paying people in yen, but buying in dollars. Um, I, I had no idea about sort of, you know, Forex risk, um, you know, even sort of HR, you know, we were a recruitment company. But I'm sure we were breaking all these HR rules by operating in different jurisdictions around the world. Uh, and, you know, it just started to, to panic me, started to worry me. And and what do you do? You just keep, keep piling more and more cash in because you think, you know what, we're just going to keep on trading. We'll trade out of this. Um, but, um, but, yeah, I think it was, um, I probably should have taken more advice, more, more, you know, proper professional, you know, accountancy advice. Um, I should have brought on board uh, a, rather than sort of damping down on, on a, the best sales director and the best sales manager in the industry. Perhaps I should have brought on board a finance director. Perhaps I should have brought on board a compliance officer that that kept our business in check, uh, and I didn't. Um, and I didn't mind because I had this tap of of, of cash that I create through my other business. Well, what happens is that you know nine eleven hits everybody. It has a ripple effect across all businesses, and all of a sudden my core company was making less margin. My tertiary uh, to actually business was was making less margin, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm now you know in a situation where I've got a margin call on debt that I can't make, and I've got wages to pay that I can't afford and you um, start to go into quite a deep spiral dive. What was the sort of lowest or most difficult point of that period? Uh, having to remortgage my house and not tell them what, at the time my wife, uh, that was no. quite a low point. Um, having to admit, um, you know, that uh, I'd failed, uh, that was quite a tough one. Um, and knowing when, it, but it's quite cleansing actually, it's quite cleansing. When you when you admit it to yourself that I've, you know, I've, I've cocked up, I can't pull myself out of this and then you have to go into a, 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 into a, a, a voluntary liquidation um, that that takes the pressure off you slightly um, and one thing I'm very proud about and I mentioned it before but I did pay back all my debts mm. um, I didn't um, I didn't uh, not pay anybody including HMRC so um, everybody got paid their money it took me three years to do it and mm. I got paid back my money. and I presume your wife knows about the house now She's my ex-wife now, <laughs> but it wasn't through that. <laughs> it wasn't through that. Um, uh, yeah, but it was. Um, I, I used to have to, you know, I, I sort of waited at the end of the the driveway. We had this long driveway to our house, and um, I was like, you know, I had to wait there for the postal to arrive so that I could intercept the post before it actually got picked up. So uh, you know, that was. Uh, I was making out. I was doing my stretching at the end of the driveway and doing my press ups against the wall. But really, I was waiting for the postman. So I could grab the rewards document. Wow! Um, don't don't do that, everybody. Please, that that's not a cool thing to do, and hopefully that cannot be held in evidence against me. Uh, this was done many many years ago. Mm. I mean, uh, that must have caused more pressure to you, right? That you're having to put your own personal finances on the and the line to get you out of that hole as well. Yeah, but you, when you own a business, there's a fine line between personal finances and, and company finances. Ultimately, as a director, I have a, a fiduciary responsibility to make sure the company's run in 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 a legal way. And, and you're not allowed to own trade; that's illegal. You, sorry, you're not allowed to trade insolvent. That's that's against the law, and um, that would have put me at risk as a director. Uh, that would have put me into the realms of, of acting illegally, uh, and that scared me. That really scared me. So if I had to put my own cash in to, to, to bankroll the business to make sure that I at least kept it float above water and the fact that we wasn't trading illegally, then that's what I had to do. Um, you know, you can't hide behind the the, the, the veil of, of a limited company if you don't act in the best interest of the shareholders. It's illegal. You can't do that. It's wrong. 
and was there any other options for you to to turn that business around and 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 salvage it and save it? Not really. Um, you know, we had um, we had an our sort. I mean, the landlords are pretty good. You know, they allowed us to 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 break the clause early as long as we paid up the money to certain periods. <clears throat> um, we didn't have too much equipment on on lease or anything like that. So we it was a, it was a quite a cash heavy business at the very beginning. Um, so we managed to, to to get out of it, and you know, it was still you know at nine months later that the airline industry wasn't back to full to full capacity. Um, you know, uh, delays on the way that we board. It's the norm now. You know, mm. most of your listeners now see that it's normal to be able to take a hundred mil of water. You know, years ago, you could just walk on a plane with a wherever you want and, you know, walk on with a gun. You know, there was none of this sort of security that we have now. So uh, it took, um, you know, uh, many, many months and almost years for the industry to get back uh, to, uh, to where it was. Um, and I had to concentrate on my core company um, so no, um, I decided it wasn't salvageable or sellable. The best thing to do was just to get rid of it. And you mentioned about the, the goal, I suppose, and the motivation of trying to be, you know, like Richard Branson and Virgin and create this, um, this kind of brand, but obviously that company had nothing to do with the other company. Um, so do you think no. that you kind of, you know, just over kind of stretched yourself there and, you know, obviously you didn't know anything about the, the airline industry for what well, you knew less about the airline industry than you did about um, telecoms. So, yeah, was that a, a, just a case of overstretching yourself? And then I suppose the second question to that is, did you ever try and then create that Virgin brand again? Or did, was that like, that's the end of me trying to be Virgin? Yeah, I, th I think sort of, you know, there was common shareholders between both businesses. Uh, there was no cross company guarantees or anything. So it was a standalone business and it had no connection to, you know, um, we were working with the NHS, we were working with big companies and, you know, it was a, a, a successful business to that Europe group. Um, you know, we were a PLC. So, you know, we had, uh, we, we had audited accounts. Um, so I wanted to keep that business completely separate to you. But I, on our on our, our website, our global website, we had this sort of group company, and Ocean IT was on the group company website, and we soon took that off, um, so that we sort of hid that disaster. Um, but um, but yeah, no, um, it, you know, growing a brand, um, a brand is is, is not, the, you know, we, we're going into a, a slightly a tangent here, but a brand is much more than just a logo. A brand is 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 how your consumers feel about your product. That's a true brand. A, a, a brand isn't what you say about yourself. A brand is what other people say about you. A brand is a methodology. It's an ideology. It's it's so much more than just the product. And um, the Virgin brand, um, you know, uh, Sir Richard Branson is, 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 is one of those pioneers of creating a brand. And someone would argue that his brand stretched from Virgin Cola through to Virgin Brides to Virgin Records, to Virgin Atlantic, to Virgin Holidays. So, but you know, he's managed to do that, and um, because he's had that core running through that through that brand, we didn't understand that. We just thought a brand was various companies all doing pretty well, and that's not that's a, a recipe for disaster. So you didn't try to repeat it at a later po point. No, I built a, a hugely successful coffee company, and that's probably one of the best brands out there in the coffee industry at the moment. Uh, and that's a four impact company. And uh, I think that brand is a tree brand. That's a four impact brand. And I think that's doing really, really well. Uh, I sold that business in January this year. So, um, and uh, it's now owned by a brilliant MBO team, uh, well financed and well backed. And, you know, that's a great brand, but it's not mm. that conglomerate. It's not yeah. Yeah. a mob sheep. Yeah. I just wanted to touch on um, something you said as earlier which is obviously more about, about the personal impact of, of of that failure you you said a couple of times that you really didn't want that business to fail and you felt the i suppose a personal um impact of, of that on you and i don't know if you used the word shame but that's kind of how it sounded you you felt that maybe you did you feel that you let your parents down potentially or other people down? Um, I, I, 
you know, we had a lot of staff at the time and, um, you know, we had different offices for, for the different divisions of the business. And, uh, uh, and it, you know, word soon gets out that one of the companies is in trouble. Um, but it's not surprising, actually, because it, there was a global disaster. Mm. So, you know, the, 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 the knock-on effect, the, the, the Richter scale there was, was, was pretty high already. So there was a lot of companies that, that, were, that were in trouble over this uh, this this time in shit. Um but I think yeah there was a sense of um, um, you know uh, yeah it, you know at the time I had a nice car but I had a director spy outside my offices and you know I, I thought I could uh, you know I had my handmade suits and uh, all the stuff that you thought were, was a prerequisite of running a successful business uh, in the mid nineties um, but I think it was just a shame actually actually having a business that uh, I couldn't pay the bills. It's like having renting a house and not for me. It's like being, being told that the red man's coming and you've got to hide behind the curtains because you can't afford to pay the rent. You know, that's the, the, the shame of that. And that's how I felt. But is that because you were on such a high with your beliefs and your mindset about you, yourself and what you could achieve and what that company was potentially going to achieve? You know, you use the words working on water, sorry, walking on water. And then you've obviously been, in some ways, landed with a bump, uh, you know, with the the impact of of nine eleven. Uh, so that feels like a massive contrast, right? Of how, that huge belief, but then you know, feeling the effects of of that um, business running out of cash and having to close it. Is that why it was felt so difficult? Yeah, because we, we'd run our business so well before. And um, that they were they, they'd grown over the years, and we we knew the marketplace inside out. We knew how we were going to get paid within the NHS. We knew the clients that we were working with. We were market leaders in delivering, you know, fixed line telephony and uh, you know data networks. Um, our, our you know the work was exemplary. The engineers were beautifully dressed. Our vans were immaculate, and it was just a brilliant, brilliant business. And um, and and I was just annoyed at myself that I didn't apply those those simple principles to the recruitment company. Um, uh, and, and it was just, yeah, it was, um, you know, it was a failure. It was, um, I got it wrong. I, you know, I have to, I have to deal with that. And uh, I bounced back. It, it doesn't, it doesn't derail me. I went on to set up another three more businesses after that. So, you know, you wouldn't have done that if I was scarred beyond the ability to go and dust myself down and do it again. So absolutely no problems at all. You know, it's, uh, you learn a lot from that and, uh, I could tell you one thing, I, I wouldn't make that mistake again. That's one thing I'm absolutely cast iron sure about. And could you pinpoint that mistake just down to one thing? Um, yeah, just, um, you know, uh, when when you're given a big bag of cash and you're told to turn that into two bags, you don't start to protect the first bag. You just start to throw the cash everywhere and don't worry because it's an infinitely, you know, that more cash pulls in. So, you know, whereas if I gave you a wad of cash and said, make every pound work, you would then, you know, line that money out. You'd put some towards the recruitment. You'd put a, a, a small margin in place just in case there was a, there was peaks and troughs in the business. And you would you would protect that cash much better than the way I protected it during that time. So, uh, and I think it was because we were trading on the back of a successful business. Um, and and that's, that's where we got it wrong. And that's interesting as well, isn't it? Because obviously, if you built that business in isolation, you would probably run it in a different way. But it's because you had the other business bankrolling it. I suppose that helped to well that that gave you a completely different approach by the sounds of things. Correct, a hundred percent. And you've nailed it there. Absolutely nailed it. Because I didn't really look at it as 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 a singular business. I looked at it as a as a, as a business that was being funded to the other group activities, uh, and, and that was my my delta, and that was my. Uh, and I didn't. Um, I didn't want to ask. You know, I had a, I had a great FT in my other company, um, but my pride wouldn't allow me to talk to him and tell him that what's going wrong in this business because I didn't want him to tell my partners in the telecoms company. So, uh, oh, I was the overall founder of the business. I was the group mm. CEO founder. But, you know, I, I'm the I'm at the top of the pyramid. So, you know, I this I, I I I'm the one they come to for problems. I don't give them problems down the line. They give me their problems, and, mm. and that's where I, I knocked up. So, did that ultimately dent your pride? Yeah, massively. So, <laughs> I'll tell you what it did do. It actually taught me to 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 be to be uh, open with people 
and it taught me to, uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, and I've worked, you know, a couple of brilliant CEOs post uh, that, 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 uh, the chief exec of my coffee company, who I don't own anymore, is, is brilliant, fantastic guy, amazing guy. So, uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm quite happy to, uh, to share my failings because, uh, you know, I've learned that that's the only way you're going to learn, isn't it? 100%. And what other learnings did you take from that that then sort of propelled you on with your later success? Um, you know, you, you, uh, again, managing cash flow is, is, is always going to be uh, the cornerstone of every business that I ever get involved in. Um, so, you know, have you got enough cash to trade? Um, you know, delivery uh, of services. Um, you know, we undercut everybody. Uh, we just come in and put in better people at a less amount of money and was looking at economies of scale. And that's not tenable. That's, you know, you can't do that because eventually that's going to catch up on you. So, you know, just looking at, at the way uh, I tend to reverse engineer businesses now, I tend to look at my exit plan at the very beginning and work out how I can engineer that over the, the three, five or seven or 10 years it takes to, to get that exit over, over the line. And um, I tend to, when I start businesses now, uh, I am looking for that exit within that initial business plan, which seems a bit mad. It seems a bit sort of, you know, ask about it, but really um, that's, that's, that's how I look at business now as a vehicle to get to where I want to be. Yeah, no, that's a great um, sort of, approach just out of interest i suppose on that is there any good resources uh, on um business exits out there that um you could you know recommend for listeners oh i don't know really i'm not a great one for podcasts and that sort of stuff so it's rare that i record a podcast and i'm, I'm doing one with you now so um and it tweaked my interest because you're not talking about successes you're talking about failures so that sort of tweaked my interest and we had a good conversation beforehand um, but no, I, I probably, uh, I'm not really into self-help books. What I think that you should do as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur is get yourself a mentor, get yourself a business coach, get someone there that it isn't part of your business that you don't have to report to, that you have confidence that you can share your, your darker thoughts with and your happier thoughts. So, um, I, I always looked at that as a failure, but now I'm a massive, massive advocate for getting yourself a really good mentor or business coach that can help you make decisions. No, great advice. And I suppose one question I also had was, how did you bounce back from that setback and, and that business closing, given, you know, that it felt like or it sounded like it hurt so much? And obviously, you know, you had this debt overhanging you that you know you you paid off after three years but obviously that was you know hanging over your head how did you manage to bounce back because i'm sure there's people in a similar position that wouldn't be able to bounce back so easily yeah so the reason we we, we say we as opposed to i because you know there was more than just me in this business um what it allowed us to do was to was just cut cut this this business out of the company um and it allowed us to focus on our core company uh, and it allowed us to focus on growing our telco business, um, and it and it focused us, and it allowed us to to just work really hard to make sure we could generate the profits to pay off the debt that we'd incurred. So um, we spent the next three years uh, really building this business, and um, and then after that, the success carried on. It was like a snowball effect. So uh, it was a really dampened down. You know, what do you do? You look at yourself in the mirror, and you think, you know, what I'm putting on some weight, or I need to go for a run. So you just go down the gym and you hit it hard and you hit it hard and then you start to feel good and you get this momentum. So we just focus on our core business and we just kicked into touch the old business with a payment plan to pay everybody back um, and, and didn't think about it again. Um, you know, and I, I probably would never, ever go into recruitment again. But it sounds like you were kind of quite pragmatic about it in the end. You've got to be. You've got to be. You can't go crying into your beer. You can't be sitting there sort of crying into a handkerchief and saying, oh, the world's dealt me a bad hand. you got to deal with that hand, haven't you? Uh, and I know that's easier said than done, but um, even if I didn't have um, an associate company, I would have traded myself out by doing something else anyway. So um, I, mm. you know, I'm, I'm, I, I would back myself in every situation to be able to get myself out of trouble. So um, 
Yeah. If it wasn't my core company, it would have been another business that I would have founded. And at the the lowest points of that, when you know you had to remortgage your house and keep that a secret, and you know the feeling of that is probably a bit of a, a, a kick in the teeth that you know you, you've you've kind of failed. How did you kind of remain positive? How did you keep that positive mindset? Because I know you're very into kind of positive thinking as well. But in those darkest moments of that that biggest challenge that you had, how did you? What was your self talk? Yeah, well, I've got two children at the time. I had two kids and, um, you know, I had a, a supportive family behind me. Um, and I had, I knew I had a lot of ability to be able to trade out and to do it again. Um, so I didn't lose my confidence. Um, my confidence was still there. Um, you know, you, you, you just took a punch. You know, how does a, a boxer that, that that's lost his first fight after 15 wins bounce back? You know, and it's just like that. You, you, it doesn't make you a, a, a worse fighter. It doesn't make you any bad. It doesn't make you. It doesn't mean you've lost your skill because you've lost one fight. You know, you've won fifteen. You've lost one. Do the math. You know, um, I looked at the companies that I, I, I built, I'd sold, I'm, I was running. I looked at the clients that we were dealing with, and all of that was positivity. It was, it was positive, and you know, um, yeah, and 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 that was it. Was it was it was a roadmap. It was a, uh, you know, it was something that, uh, I mean, you know, the thing is, don't do it again. That, that's the key thing you know it frustrates me when I see entrepreneurs go bust three or four times uh, and this rubbish that you hear it's only in America where they say I'll only back you when you've had three failed businesses I don't get that you know I'll back somewhere if they've failed three times you know they're, 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 there's a trend being set there so maybe I'm a little bit more um, careful with my cash but you know I certainly wouldn't back somewhere that's failed three times you know they're certainly not learning from their mistakes yeah, yeah, no, that that's definitely a a kind of big policy for some VC firms, definitely in in America. So, what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs about handling the fear of failure? Because you mentioned um, that you didn't want to fail in that business, and I wonder if you had a bit of fear of of failing uh, as well, potentially. But for anyone new out there, um, what advice would you give them for, around that? Yeah, so so the, the fear of failing is is natural. The fear of failing is is uh, it's it's embedded into our human DNA. If we wasn't afraid of anything, we'd been eaten by wee mallets. You know, we're designed to be scared. We're designed to to look at that danger. It's just danger. Uh, you know, presents itself in a different way. So, um, you know, no, there's no wee mammoth that's going to eat me if I walk outside the house now. Um, but the tax man may try to get hold of me if I don't pay my tax returns. So that has the same primal fear. So um, I think that, you know, don't worry about failure because it's if you know about it, then you can address it before you fail. But, you know, d don't feel it. it's a bogeyman that's going to come and eat you at night and come and attack you. Um, you know, failure is, is something that um, it keeps you sharp. It keeps you motivated. It keeps you doing the right thing. Because without a sense of failure, sometimes you can derail. You can go off at a tangent. You could not, you know, apply your own logic, which is exactly what I did when I created a company that I knew nothing about in a highly competitive industry with a massive cost barrier to get involved in. Um, you know, all of the warning signals I just I just didn't take on board. Um, and that's that's not a failure. That's stupid. That's stupidity. It's it's, uh, it's arrogance. There's a difference between failure and arrogance. Yeah, no, that's an interesting reflection um, that you that you just made there, and I, I suppose a important distinction because actually I think you didn't have a fear of failure by the sounds of things when you kicked off that business. The fear of failure came when you were probably looking over the the edge of the cliff, right? Yeah, I think sort of you know we've always got a fear of failure as I said, it's, it's embedded in in the human DNA. I think that uh, you you just believe your own hype sometimes as you know you, you yeah. just think that yeah you know if, you, i know if i touch that fire it's going to burn my finger but i'll go as close as i mm. can because you know i'm quicker than the reaction of the pain mm. but you're not you know the, you, you're not quicker you put your finger on that fire you are going to get burned and i think that yeah but you you know you know that statement you know you shouldn't go there mm. you just still do it human beings do that um mm. and it just makes you a better person once you've been Stole it once, you know. A child won't touch that hot kettle of cane after. Absolutely. So, just wrapping up, if you could go back in time and erase that 
failure from happening and that recruitment business from actually failing, would you do that? Yeah, absolutely, hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, although I learned from it, and although it was a so you would you would you do you wouldn't want it to happen. No, no, no. I, I would rather not have a failure than than be sitting mm. with you talking about my failure. Um, mm. You know, I, it, it still pains me to talk about it, but I've learned to live with it, and I, I won't do it again. Um, but I, I'd rather have just retired on that fifteenth fight. Maybe not have gone for the sixteenth fight and lost. I may have you know got into a different a different field. Um, so no, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not proud of it. I'm, I'm not, I don't, it's not a badge of honor that I wear with pride. Um, mm. you know, you've done incredibly well to, 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 to pull that out of me because I, 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 I don't like to kind of fade it. It's not something I feel comfortable with. And that's interesting because actually normally the answer to that question is people say they are, were happy with the failure because it's taught them so much and it's, you know, they've. They've learned from it, and they, it's they've it's led on to success. But your actually your answer is the opposite. So, are you sort of saying that the lessons you got from it weren't worth the the cost? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I you know it's I knew what I was doing wrong. I was I was gambling. Uh, I'm not of gamble. I, I don't gamble. I never gamble. I wouldn't even know how to place a bet. But I was gambling. I was gambling there with with. With money and uh, and I, I I did it wrong and uh, you know I'm uh, I, and you ask me a question I'm going to give you an honest answer um, mm. you know I'm I'm going to tell you how I feel about that and I'm not going to sugarcoat it and if a hundred people tell you yes they've learned from their failure I'm that one person saying oh, you know I didn't like it at all or, I'm, I, you know trust me I could have learned a lot had I not failed and maybe I'd have been more successful maybe I would have been richer uh, maybe I'd have more money but like. Who, who knows? Um, no, I no. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it's there. I've done it. You've gone through it, and you got to deal with it. Mm. Mm. Amazing. So we always end on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and um, short answers. So, question one: failure is avoidable. What's your life's mission? To be happy. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to other people on your deathbed? Just do it. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. Positive mindset. If you could be immortal, would you take it? Yes. Why is that? Like I, I enjoy life. I, you know, it's a, yeah, if I could live forever, I'd, I'd love it. You know, well, maybe I wouldn't. I mean, that's a tough one. But I have to sort of answer that quickly. And uh, you're asking, would I be, would I rather die or would I rather live? So if you run that question down, <laughs> of course I'm going to say I want to live. Absolutely. And if there was another business person in the world that you could swap places with, who would that be? Elon Musk, and I would run Twitter. I'm going to call it X. I'd run Twitter better. I'd like to think. I'd love to delve into that in a whole different <laughs> podcast. And who's a uh, guest that you can recommend that you think I should have on? Oh, I don't know. It's a good one. Uh, I'd have to come back to you on that because uh, I know quite a few people that would add a, a new dynamic to your podcast. And I think having a, a different view and different answers keeps your podcast fresh. Perfect. So, Scott, where can people connect with you and find you? Um, LinkedIn is probably uh, the best place to find me. Just search my name, Scott Russell. Um, you'll see me on there. And... Uh, or you can follow me on uh, Instagram and uh, X if you want to. <laughs> You're at pains to say X there. <laughs> well, um, Scott, thanks so much for uh, for being here today and for your honesty. And I know it was a difficult conversation. You didn't like talking about failure, but I appreciate um, everything that you you know shared with everyone. And I know people will get a lot of value out of today. So thank you very much. It's been my absolute pleasure. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.